www.dem.net. That will be it's for varieties-democracies.net, and then they have a slash en slash, which isn't necessary for. It will figure it out where you're from. Um, that is the leading academic database for the kinds of things that we are looking at in the World Development Report, and it's uh, concerted globally with area specialists, teams for every country, uh, careful attention to uh, validation of measures and definition, um, uh, definitions, uh, reliabilities, and it goes back to, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 years, as far back as it makes sense to look at some kind of a rise of democracies. And it includes certain measures that are uh, have a real cutting edge to them from the people who are doing it, which includes um, executive corruption, the extent to which the members of the executive branch, the top of governments, favor their friends and their cronies and other groups uh, in their uh, economically. In the grants. Which direction so, is that going in? <laughs> <laughs> there are a number of cases that, <laughs> around the world. So uh, it, it helps, I think, it's an independent check, uh, at least to stimulate thinking about uh, issues of government. And frankly, as you may know, democracy is in trouble internationally. The belief after World War II that this was the right answer and everybody was going to sign on eventually after the, after the, uh, the end of history. Um, and then and the democracies would continue by a natural logic to improve themselves as steady progress. All that's being called into question at the moment. Um, and then we have backsliding both um, China and the Middle East, uh, in Eastern Europe, um, and worse of signs that people have to interpret. So uh, it's it's is response, responding to a genuine trend and with real depth trying, as the World Bank is, I think, to illuminate um, what is going on, uh, which I don't think any of us quite knows yet uh, in any depth. The, the, the second one is called gdelt.org. It's also gdeltproject.org. It is a way to track a great many things, I think especially called global cultural change and the role of women um, and the discussion about that as a cultural phenomenon that we're trying to affect in the world. Um, that is by Google. It is, has an enormous amount of money behind it. Um, it has realized the dreams of many social scientists to come up with a way to look at social progress analogous to what economists traditionally came up with with their national accounting systems and production functions and uh, um, so Laswell and others dreamed that you could have through content analysis eventually a set of fashioned measures that would understand emotions and agenda setting and at least help you to track the whole processes of change in the world, in society and in culture with a sense that cultural change is more so than anybody has addressed in the political science literature, one of the critical puzzles and dimensions and a recognition that we have actually many cultures and subcultures emerging in the world. Um, the first being the National Geographic culture where everyone dresses up in their nation, national costumes and, um, and uh, and you ignore the fact that they're natural, they wear blue jeans, everybody wears blue jeans. Um, in the, uh, uh, but we look at youth cultures, it has a capacity to look at youth cultures and women's cultures and um, Davos cultures and professional cultures and a whole range of other capabilities. So it's all the printed material news in the world from every country translated thanks to artificial intelligence uh, we, every every 15 minutes into very good English uh, from across um, all of the languages of the world and um, an enormous amount of uh, state-of-the-art analysis software especially about emotions and feelings and themes and so it's not just cognitive it's it's really getting to motive forces and um, passions and emotions and emotional consensus processes within cultures. So I'm using it, I don't mind telling you the other thing, but I think it's, I think it's underused and uh, 
They, for some obvious reasons, Google is keeping a bit low visibility these days, but it's intended for researchers and, uh, um, and it's a superb resource. Um, and it's backed, as I say, by their uh, wonderful breakthroughs in AI and uh, automatic machine translations. They have huge, huge databases of frequency of things per thousand, per trillion strings. <laughs> uh, the envy of every computer scientist, graduate student who's looked up language translations. So it's, it, it can, within domains like public affairs or an area of science, get really high levels of accuracy. I'm going to tell you. Uh, one, a couple of things about perspective on uh, influence and money and uh, on things, and a couple of, and some very quick cases. Um, in political psychology, we think of change in the world towards morality as a function of right now is of, of a distributed set of sensibilities. It's the Kohlberg Moral Development Scale, which has been worked on internationally, and it argues, like as with Piaget, uh, of, of development of children, that human beings develop capacity for more reasoning at six different levels, and you, everyone starts out at below, down at one, one and two, which is pre-moral, and which is uh, it's okay. It's okay to do if you. Um, unless you get punished for it, <laughs> or um, or pure pragmatism. Um, why should you should you steal a drug to help your wife cure cancer? And, and he says, well, yes, of course, because otherwise I would have to cook a deep house for myself. <laughs> that, that's pre-moral. <laughs> um, then there are the conventional moralities, which is conformity and uh, good boy, good citizen, good person, um, and social judgment. And fourth is. Uh, conventional is authority, in which it's the rule of law, or what the prophet said, or what the Ten Commandments, or what other, other things. And then beyond that, to post-conventional, you, uh, and most people on the planet are at four or below, um, and then three or four primarily in many, most of the developed countries, and then five is a more participatory sense of ethics, like social contract theory, in which we, we can make up the decisions about morality, but it's participatory. And then the, the sixth one is Kantian universalism, which uh, is sort of the Western ideal of enlightened behavior, but it is I-thou relations, and everybody as a human being uh, under universal laws um, that you would uh, agree could be applied to you if the case was returned. So it's kind of golden rule, but asking is that what people are doing if they think about things open with empathy to the world. Uh, against that background, the, the uh, construction that uh, social psychologists from these traditions would put on the question of uh, how do you allocate money and how do you get accountability and how do you make change in the world is um, how do people who are more enlightened um, uh, activists, uh, who are more universal, who are more compa compa motivated by compassion, um, nurturing life generally, or human flourishing for everybody, um, somehow bring along an entire world that is actually become democratic in which people will potentially could vote, but they're not up there to, to up there yet. And so part of the problem is how you bring along a, a range of sensibilities and initial responses to any sets of proposals for doing things. Um, and so against that background, which we could discuss much more, I would just say uh, there's a set of tensions within democratic cultures. For example, if you were to look at from this lens about how you got school integration in the United States, there was an allocation of money through a specific strategy for more enlightened progressive people who built a research base that went to the Supreme Court on uh, separate but equal, and, and it was a very sophisticated process, and came in essentially at a level six, a kind of universal ethics kind of interpretation of what the American Constitution is about and the spirit of it and so forth, and got the court to agree. And by doing that, you got authority behind you, 
um, from the uh, Supreme Court ruling to get rid of, to segregate, to um, integrate the schools and, and segregation. And it was enforced by Dwight Eisenhower, Commander in Chief of the World War II Rectory, uh, who was willing to send in troops. So you con conveyed a the the st strategy that had was developed allocated funds to build institutions and deal with the mechanisms by which you could change American society and in places and in ways you couldn't get to by democracy. I mean, this was the sense. You try to go pre school board by school board throughout the South and convince them by rationality or prayer or preaching or whatever, forget it. So um, we, have a, a, we have a beginning of strategic allocation of funds to interfere with a, uh, with a democratic process or the existing attitudes, if you didn't, nobody wanted to ask the Southerners about segregation, um, because what they needed to do was to get the Supreme Court to be more progressive, and this is a rule for everybody, and by the way, it's a, we then honor the respect and standing of this Constitution and the law and authority. So um, that's one story I wanted just to mention about allocation of money. Um, uh, and, and I think we still live with those questions. And we live, by the way, with backlash because there are people around the country who on other strategic uses of allocating funds for strategy like gay marriage or legalization of marijuana have a very clear sense that somebody has captured the Supreme Court <laughs> and the justices and is pushing them around and destroying classic America. And so you can find out where the red states are and the appeal to some of these resentments. But that's been one of the strategies to just try to make a better world uh, within, within the system, but without using, quote unquote, everybody getting to vote on it. <laughs> um, so, uh, and we pay a price. Well, there, there are consequences, but something all the world, other countries solve in a, maybe a better way. But um, the, the second story I just want to tell you, which speaks to how different actors in the world are thinking about democracy, trying to innovate to, uh, to get objectives. Um, this, is, this is a story about China. Um, when Hillary Clinton came in uh, as a Secretary of State, she found that um, a fury was reported to her from the government of China and the people of China. The United States um, had pulled out uh, from by an action of, act of Congress from participating in a world um, uh, was a world trade. Not to, what am I trying to think of? Um, the TDPI. It's the, mm -hmm. the TDPI. Or it's a kind of world trade show. Um, world trade organization. No, no. It's the uh, the big celebration. World show. Of the expo, oh, the expo yeah, yeah. an expo yeah, yeah. kind of yeah, yeah. event in China, yeah, yeah. and it was considered to be awful and disrespect of China and um, a horrible kind of thing to do. And um, as it got sorted through, um, uh, Hillary Clinton said, "You know, I didn't even know there was an expo in China, <laughs> and you know, there's huge flap going on." And so um, she quickly got stirred up and so forth. But then that opened up a very interesting set of conversations with the government of China and the foreign minister saying, look, we didn't know, I didn't know, Congress didn't know when they decided to save money and ax that from the budget that, you know, how you were going to respond. Um, the larger story I want to tell you is about China and um, trade relations with the United States still unfolding. Um, uh, in the earlier days, when China did have an embassy in Washington, they would um, communicate to members of Congress or to the executive branch what China wanted, what China expected. And they tend to be very self-interested in that presentation, which was um, uh, period. No discussion of reciprocity is what China wanted you to do. And when China failed with the US Congress, which it did, the ambassador of China responded by blast faxes <laughs> from the embassy to every member of Congress, telling them that China was very displeased. 
um, and that uh, things were in jeopardy and so forth. Um, out of that, Henry, now one of the wrinkles in this is Henry Kissinger uh, took a lead, as have many others since then, in setting up former government officials consulting organizations or working for Washington lobbyists and building foreign clientele. And through a process I won't go into, um, uh, there was a whole range of consulting with the government of China, and they were convinced to, uh, by serious people, to put money into um, education about lobbying, but also hiring people with ends in the United States process to give them um, uh, insight into how the whole system here actually worked, and that you did not send blast faxes to every member of Congress, and how to build a coalition within America. And uh, Kissinger and Associates did some high-level work, but most of it was done by lawyers within Washington who, if you know how that works, uh, can lo learn more about every single individual on a congressional committee than maybe any human being has a right to know. I mean, they, the research is can be extraordinary to every, um, into their, which sister works for a hospital, you know, how do you get to these people? They hire former members of the committee staffs or the personal staffs of the chairman. They hand, uh, they imply long-term employment uh, after if someone is defeated so they can give insights to their colleagues. It's an extraordinary operation. And out of that came a whole refined sensibility from China about how the U.S. Congress worked. There was a congressional coalition built of uh, China-American trade with everyone who was significantly from their district um, uh, in members, key members of Congress as a member. Uh, people were in, and senior aides were invited to China. Um, Chinese delegations came here and met Americans at rodeos out in Wyoming. Um, a whole series of activities got underway, and those have continued. And what you see now from the allocation of China, and I think several other countries have tried it as well, but not at the ex this level of expense, a sophistication on trade battles and negotiations with America, which is extraordinary. Um, they have, as you may have read, targeted every single congressional district <laughs> uh, that, that, that is, um, and made sure that there was going to be pain coming back on soybeans, on whole things to members of Congress who were supporting Donald Trump. And uh, it's still unfolding itself, but the point here is that the, interf the interference in the internal affairs of the governance process in other countries is well along <laughs> and supported by money, and it possibly works well. You don't have to rely on spies. Uh, you don't have to rely, as they were doing, Beijing, on ha getting hackers to um, tab get hold of the uh, emails among congressional staffers to try to figure out secretly what's going on. You can, you know, hire Henry Kissinger. You can hire uh, John Negroponte, who was used to be head of uh, national intelligence. Um, there are a great many people who are well connected and thoughtful, and who can ask and, and tell you uh, be intermediaries in a process that actually has a great deal of legitimacy. So that's that's just the second uh, story I wanted to tell you about things happening in the world about governance processes and that go from simple enemy image or unitary images of China's of America or America of China and um, gives you a whole range of people who are connected and thoughtful and uh, working for pay but um, uh, buying in a sense um, a more effective governing system at least for their interests, and as I say, we'll see. The, now, there's been pushback, um, as people have discovered with the Chinese growing influence, there have been people who have thought that <laughs> they shouldn't have that much, but they are a legitimate, a legitimate lobbyist now in, in Washington and providing substantial income in this town. Um, one final comment about cultural strategies and funding. If you take a look at uh, gay marriage, or at the legalization of marijuana, you will see what has not been written about from the human rights community, the level of sophistication <laughs> and to a degree a level of money that can selectively be poured into certain goals. And then the level of thinking about culture and cultural change because 
the gay rights in America began with a violent protest, a march, violent protests. And they didn't now, but if you now track the strategy, there's money that has gone into, went into national sitcoms in which um, characters in sitcoms, kind of charming people, were had were gay, and you had a lot of things going on out into the heartland of America. You had the uh, uh, late night humor shows, uh, um, The Daily Show, and others. I will all pick that up as kind of good spirited humor about those right wing comments or something, with it conveying the sense of dignity and respect, really, to all people. And uh, but a part of of a youth, more youth audience and a college-oriented audience, um, with a sense that the you know the this real sensibility was of human beings, and then you slowly built um, various ways through court systems to suddenly to begin to or legislatures to start to very quietly, and I think the right wing is still stunned by that um, about how how that happened, but. Uh, um, so, uh, and then one final story, which begins back with the Republicans and the use of um, uh, social science in a somewhat embarrassing way. The American political system has fallen to a point where, in elections, it's it's decided a lot by turnout. It's a low turnout, so that it's not the issues. If you can get your hardcore cut to come out, then you can win in a lot of different constituencies, and that's particularly true in primaries. So. The, uh, the um, early strategies that the Republicans came up to as they th began to uh, do actual research and think about things was what was called God, gays, and guns as uh, in the professional circles of um, campaign consulting. In other words, uh, they decided that every election was going to be about God's, God, uh, you know, a prayer in the schools in the early days, or gays, and transgender bathroom <laughs> rules or gun gun control, which is one of the best hot button issues. It gets people scared and it gets people angry who are uh, natural constituents and they will turn out. Um, I and it's, add migrants to that list too, yeah? Now it's not, now it's migrants. The, the generating, unfortunately the generating grammar is fear and anger. And anything you can do, particularly you know, as a president, president, or just sort of, if you can capture media and keep coming back at this over and over, generate fear and anger, and they will turn out if they get. If, um, and that's become on the far on the Republican side one of the defining and highly sophisticated and refined methods of winning elections. Um, and I underscore. It is not natural expression of the American people or some mystical change that, that it is orchestrated, it's financed by the Koch brothers, it's, um, it's um, and it may be late, but the, um, the degree to which money is manipulation is keyed in on fear and anger, given unique characteristics of winning American elections and participation is remarkable and, um, uh, grim, um, and I will say uh, it's been a problem. It's now it's obviously on the Democratic side too, because fear and anger at Donald Trump and what he said about women, and uh, you know, and and Judge Kavanaugh and women, and you know, so getting people angry and fearful uh, of catastrophe and the, the other side right now is what these psychological insights about fight flight responses and other things are being used for and unfortunately the major american i'm going on too long unfortunately the major american consulting firms have mostly opened have almost all opened up international operations mm -hmm. to advise political clients in other countries and uh and there's been about 200 elections now including now in, in some in india and in third world countries where the the bad guys in some sense have hired uh some of these people to help um maneuver, manipulate their campaigns so um the standard way of, of thinking about money and politics on bribery and votes is giving way unfortunately to a much more sophisticated intelligent college educated um 
uh, application. Uh, and I don't see a chance that it's going to go away unless we can think of some, some solutions, maybe, maybe tomorrow. But um, 